such as the contraction convergence model, most of these would actually result um, in a net transfer of wealth from the developed world to the developing world through carbon quotas and, and, and domestic tradable quotas and so on. So as a result of bringing about carbon emissions, this would actually help the developing um, countries develop um, to, to, um, in a sustainable way and get their uh, population growth under control, uh, get out of the poverty trap of um, subsistence, agriculture, and so on. But I, I think the other problem with, with that Copenhagen consensus position is that it, it was largely the result of a group of economists sitting in a room with, with calculators. And I think it's quite dangerous, well, very dangerous, actually, to, to assume that all the world's problems can be, can be worked out and solved by economists with, with calculators. And um, here's, here's one example. This is a, a photograph of part of the Himalayan glacier um, field. And about 40% of, of the world's population depends on summer meltwater uh, from Himalayan glaciers. And with unabated climate change, by 2050, quite a lot of those glaciers will have disappeared. And, and with that, the sustenance for hundreds of millions of people. So, you know, if, if Lomborg thinks that you can put a value on something like this, then I'd suggest he's been spending a bit too much time with his calculator and not enough time with human beings. It should be big companies that invest in tackling climate change, but why would a company put themselves at a competitive disadvantage to others? Well, I think this position did have some validity some time ago, but um, what we've seen it, with, um, in, in the, particularly in the last five years is a massive acceleration in, in the amount of corporate social responsibility reporting done by big companies. And increasingly, we're seeing really big household names such as Marks and Spencers um, setting themselves very demanding targets. And um, these, these four names, uh, which includes one or two that perhaps we're more accustomed to associating with corporate villainy, uh, these all have really um, bold targets that they're, they're aiming for. Coca-Cola are working with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, B Sky B have set themselves a target of being carbon neutral by, I think, 2012. Rio Tinto are working with the WWF and the Eden Project, completely transforming the way they do their business. And I, I really think there's been a fundamental shift um, from, from the, the, the kind of attitude that prevailed when the Global Climate Coalition was set up to, to what we have now. In those days, it was, it was quite common to find big companies clubbing together to actually campaign against any kind of environmental initiatives or environmental legislation. Now, you're even seeing some of these companies clubbing together to lobby in favor of, of tighter regulation um, so that they can all compete on a level playing field. The next one is, is this, isn't it up to governments to tackle this? And I think that there is quite a bit of validity to this. It's certainly true that governments could have and should have done a lot more to address climate change. Uh, the Bush administration, in, in my opinion, set um, things back at least 10 years. But you know, we shouldn't underestimate how difficult it is um, going to be to achieve this. What we need is a level of global cooperation virtually unprecedented in history. There are some positive examples of global cooperation before. You know, the, the Montreal Protocol was a, a global um, initiative uh, that limited the, the emissions of CFCs and has been very successful. The um, ozone hole is actually recovering. So, so there are uh, reasons to be, to be optimistic. And I think everyone is optimistic that the US will be coming to the climate change talks in December with a, a much more positive attitude um, under the new administration. And I've put a second one in here um, because I, I think this is part of the same um, position, really. You know, what is the point in us busting a gut when China builds a new coal-fired power station every week? Well, before we set about kind of bashing China, I, I think we should remember that there's still a big difference between um, the emissions from the average person in China and, and the developed world. So um, th these are the per capita carbon emissions from different countries. And generally, at this end, you've got the USA, Canada, most of the European developed nations. And then right at that end, you've got China. That, that bar chart does go on, by the way. China's not by no means the lowest. But it has about a third of the per capita carbon emissions of, of the UK. And China actually looks to Europe, and I believe to U the UK in particular, for leadership on this. And, and it was partly that reason um, that led them to appoint um, Arab to design the new eco-city in Dongtan. And if this gets realized, 
as it's been planned, it'll be a, a truly radical bit of urban design. Uh, uh, the first bit of urban design ever to be designed to a, a one planet um, um, eco footprint. And I think it's also fair to say that um, you know, the UK historically has, has absolutely massive um, carbon um, emissions because we were one of the first countries to industrialize. And given that we led the world into the carbon age, I think there's a very good case for saying that we should lead the world out of it. So just to, to wrap up this, this first part now, um, you know, climate change is a reality. The, the, the science is looking ever more alarming. Climate scientists met again in March and concluded that their previous uh, predictions for sea level rises were way too conservative. And we're likely to see sea level rises of, of over a meter this century. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Greenland ice shelf is breaking up far faster than predicted. If that were to collapse and, and into the sea, then we would see sea level rises of, of about six meters. We're also um, seeing um, a massive acceleration in the extinction of species, um, which is, is quite likely to lead to ecosystem collapses and so on. And often when faced with an enormous challenge, our, our first reaction is to refuse to accept that, it, that it's a reality. And uh, this is particularly common amongst people who are diagnosed with, with life-threatening um, conditions. But generally speaking, those people are encouraged to actually work through that to a state of acceptance and then a state of action. And I believe in many ways we're in a similar position with our attitudes to climate change because all of these skeptical positions are in some way a refusal to accept the reality. You know, starting with it's not happening to it is happening and it's nothing to do with us. It is something to do with us, but there's nothing we can do about it. We can do something about it, but it's not our responsibility. It is our responsibility, but we're not going to do anything because and, and so on. So I, I feel that those, those positions are largely untenable, but also really quite uninspiring, and, and that it's, it's much more courageous and inspiring to actually take on that challenge, to accept that it's a reality, and, and to do something about it. And that's what I want to talk about in the, in the second part of the talk. But just before I do that, are there any kind of skeptical positions that I haven't covered? Uh, are there any remaining doubts that people want to, to raise about climate change and the science of climate change? No? Okay, fine. Okay, well, in the, in the second part, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, as I said at the beginning, th this is about one way in which an architect can respond to the challenges of climate change. It's something that I'm particularly interested in. It's, it's a relatively new discipline, biomimicry. And um, this was something that I'd, I really got interested in working on the um, Eden Project. And the thing that really appeals to me about biomimicry, uh, it, it's all about looking at uh, examples from nature as a source of inspiration for new solutions.